Okay. So um, I don't. So he will bring me the last pointer. I hope the pointer you you bring. Okay. Uh, so yesterday we I introduced you uh, uh, neutrino the problem of neutrino masses. I discussed it and then I introduced you neutrino mixing and uh, neutrino oscillations and then. Uh, uh, I arrived at a point in which uh, uh, I discussed the, uh, I, I, the results of the experiments which uh, give information on the mixing of the three neutrinos, and in particular on the daytime squares, uh, so which are the difference of the square of the masses and on the uh, mixing angles. Uh, we have seen already yesterday that uh, the daytime squares are uh, determined with uh, good precision from the experimental data. So this is the result of a global fit of all the available experimental data. Uh, and uh, the precision of the determination of the delta M square is about uh, 1.3%. Uh, from the plot, uh, you remember that I noted that uh, the chi-square of the normal ordering is uh, better than the chi-square of the inverted ordering. So this is uh, normal ordering at the moment is uh, favored at a level of uh, two sigma. <clears throat> For the determination of the mixing angles, uh, these uh, two mixing angles, theta 1, 2 and theta 1, 3, are uh, determined uh, in a rather good way. So the current precision for uh, theta 1, 2, this is the solar mixing angle, is about 4%. And uh, for theta 1, 3, the uh, precision is about uh, 3 percentage. Not so good is the situation for the theta 2, 3. This is some sort of uh, strange thing. It maybe it can be puzzling because uh, uh, the last uh, uh, angle which was uh, uh, the found to exist is theta 1, 3. And this was uh, discovered in the, around 2011. And now you can see that this is the best measured angle. So uh, and that is uh, uh, because some experiments, uh, they could measure this angle with a, real, a really good accuracy. Instead of the first mixing angle, which is the theta 2, 3, which uh, generated the oscillation of atmospheric neutrinos. These are the oscillations that uh, were first determined in 1998. Uh, this mixing angle is uh, not uh, well determined, as you can see here from the uh, curve of the k square, which is rather wide. And the problem is that uh, uh, this mixing angle is uh, closest to maximal. So this uh, uh, sine square theta to 3 equal 0.5 correspond to a mixing of 45 degrees. And this is a uh, maximal mixing. And uh, in this region, uh, the, it is difficult to uh, uh, determine the mixing angle with precision. Uh, and this is explained here because uh, the uh, main data from the mixing angle come from the observation of uh, new mu disappearance. And uh, the, in the observation of new mu disappearance, the probability depends on this uh, sine square 2 theta 2 3. Now, this is uh, uh, related to sine square theta 2 3 by this uh, quadratic function. So if you plot the sine square 2 theta 2 3 as a function of sine square theta 2 3, you have this uh, uh, parabola here. And uh, the, so when uh, one can measure with good accuracy this uh, uh, survival probability, so you can see here from this illustration that uh, the accuracy can be very uh, small. The, the precision can be very good here. So uh, the uncertainty is small. But uh, uh, since the parabola is flat, just uh, near uh, around the maximal mixing, then you get a wider range for the, for the knowledge of the mixing angle. And this is a problem for the determination of theta 2, 3. So that is why the uh, theta 2, 3 is not so well determined as the uh, other angles. And the precision is at the level of uh, uh, 10 percentage. <clears throat> uh, about the CP violation phase, there is also some indication about uh, CP violation. Or, sorry. Okay. Uh, as you can see here from the, uh, the CP violation phase can vary from 0 to 360 degrees. So this is uh, 2 pi. 
And uh, the case of uh, CP conservation correspond uh, to zero or 360 degree, which are equivalent, or uh, or to uh, uh, also when delta CP is 180, this is a CP conserving. Because in the phase, uh, this uh, gives just a minus sign. So it is not a, a, there is no imaginary component in the mixing matrix. Uh, and you can see from the data, the minimum of the chi-square is uh, uh, for a relatively large uh, phase. So the current indication is, is in favor of uh, CP violation. Uh, but uh, the, this uh, indication in favor of CP, CP violation is not uh, uh, much uh, significant statistically. So we cannot draw a definite conclusion of the existence of CP violation or not. Uh, in the in the in the current data, and the new experiments in the future will explore better this uh, problem of the CP violation in the electron sector by looking at uh, neutrino oscillations. Here, uh, maybe I can only uh, emphasize the case, the fact that uh, probably Professor Branco will discuss uh, in his lectures that uh, in, in the case of uh, neutrinos, the CP violation can be very large because the angles are large. So when you consider this uh, CP, uh, this uh, Jarstock invariant, the, since this mixing angle are large, you can have a, a maximal CP violation of about uh, uh, 0.033, uh, which is uh, 10 to the 10th, which is 1,000 times larger than the CP violation me measured for the quartz. Of course, this depends on the on the value of the of the phase, but potentially the mixing the CP violation in the lepton sector can be 1,000 times larger than the CP violation in the quark sector. Uh, so this is a picture of the unitary mixing matrix, uh, and uh, with some note about how well uh, the different elements in the mixing matrix are determined. Uh, uh, the, the, si the size of the uncertainty is uh, shown graphically here because it's difficult to just to read the quickly these numbers. As you can see for uh, here, the first line, which is the electron line, has a small uncertainty. So, so this is uh, the best line, which is uh, uh, determined in the mixing matrix. So we know uh, in a reasonable way uh, well, the uh, mixing of the electron neutrino with the three massive neutrinos. For the uh, other mixing of the mu and tau neutrinos, there are large uncertainties, and the, the uncertainties in these two elements is determined by the uncertainty in theta 2, 3. And the uncertainty in these others is even larger because we have also the uncertainty of the phase. So these uh, elements are uh, not uh, well determined. And they cannot be measured directly. So this is a, a problem for the future precise determination of the mixing matrix. Uh, so uh, one can ask why it is important to measure accurately the uh, neutrino mixing parameters. Well, uh, there are several answers. So one is that uh, they are fundamental parameters. So the, the job of physicists, especially experimental physicists, is, is to measure the uh, all fundamental para parameters uh, which, uh, which are fundamental quantities in nature. But uh, there are also uh, practical uh, uh, usefulness. One is that uh, uh, this helps uh, to select uh, the uh, model which can explain uh, the origin of neutrino masses. Uh, there are many, many models which try to explain the uh, origin of neutrino masses. If you follow the archive, you can see that uh, Every day there is uh, one or even more new models which try to explain the neutrino masses. Uh, and uh, this is the, so there is a huge model space, but uh, uh, so the only way to select which are the acceptable model is to uh, measure more precisely the neutrino mixing parameters. For example, uh, before the discovery of theta 1, 3, so before 2011, uh, people considered uh, seriously this, uh, uh, what is called the 3B maximal mixing matrix, which is this, uh, which has this uh, simple form, and in which uh, the element uh, uh, UE3 is equal to zero. 
and this will uh, require that uh, theta 1, 3 is equal to 0. But uh, this was proven to be wrong when uh, theta 1, 3 was, uh, was measured. And uh, the, another problem is the, uh, what is called the mutau symmetry, in which uh, the uh, moduli of the uh, column of mu and tau are, uh, are equal. So if you measure accurately the value, for example, of theta 2, 3, and you find it different from maximal, then you can determine that, that uh, you have a breaking of this uh, mutau symmetry. And uh, the uh, measurement of, uh, uh, precise measurement of the neutrino mixing parameters is also uh, a phenomenological usefulness. And uh, in the following slides, I will give a, an example of the, of the usefulness so, uh, uh, when it is applied to the uh, 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 determination of the initial flavor composition of high energy astrophysical neutrinos. So now I have some slides on the high energy astrophysical neutrinos, which is a, a very interesting and hot topics, uh, because, topic because uh, uh, maybe you heard just uh, last week that the Ice Cube uh, collaboration and uh, other experiments, they announced that the, the first observation of uh, astrophysical neutrinos coming from a far away galaxy. Uh, in connection with observation of gamma rays from the from the same galaxies, so they can could uh, uh, identify a source uh, of a faraway galaxy which can pro produces both neutrinos and gammas. Uh, and this is a, what is called a active galactic nucleus, which uh, is composed with a galaxy with a black hole in the center, and the uh, the the one that uh, they think it produced this signal is a special type of active galactic nuclei, which is uh, called a blazar, in which the jets which uh, come uh, out of the black hole, they are one of the jets is pointed to, toward Earth, to, toward us. So they can, that is why they can see the uh, neutrino and the gamma ray. So this uh, uh, measurement was made in the uh, so I, I will not uh, discuss this measurement because this is very new and uh, uh, I did not have time to, 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 to analyze this, uh, uh, this measurement. So I will discuss something else connected with the astrophysical neutrinos. So uh, this measurement, were, in any case, was done by the ice cube detector. This is a detector which can detect neutrinos uh, and uh, through the observation of Cherenkov light uh, produced by the muons and other particles which are produced by the neutrinos when they interact with matter. The, uh, this is an array of uh, Cherenkov light detector of photomultipliers uh, in, the, in the ice, uh, which is below the South Pole. So this is, uh, the array is, uh, is, is illustrated here. This is the top of the South Pole. And uh, you can see that uh, the array is a, a huge uh, uh, kilometer cube uh, array, which is much below the surface. It is uh, 1,450 meters below the source, source edge. And the size is very huge. Uh, this is uh, in comparison to the Eiffel Tower. So you can ask why, how they can put uh, this uh, array in the ice uh, just so deep. Uh, what they do is to draw some, uh, to, to dig some hole from the surface with uh, hot water. And so they pour hot water, and this hot water just create a, a, a hole, a very deep hole in the, in the, in the ice. And then before the, the, the water uh, refreeze again, they put, they put, put inside the, this uh, string of uh, photomultipliers. And then they wait, just uh, the water again freezes, and then they cannot do anything about uh, this photomultipliers. They are just there, and uh, they hope that they can wo they work. So, uh, of course, there is a cable coming out from which they, they extract the signal. Uh, in any case, this uh, detector is a really a big, uh, uh, very important uh, realization and uh, it is working very well. Uh, it detected, uh, uh, so it can detect, as you can see from this uh, plot, uh, neutrinos, uh, uh, different type of neutrinos. 
the, at low energies, uh, they detect uh, the atmospheric neutrinos. So these are the neutrinos, like uh, uh, this one, which is produced by cosmic ray interacting with uh, the atmosphere, and then uh, producing neutrinos, which then, uh, the, for example, in this case, the neutrino is coming from the other sides of the Earth, then interact with matter, and uh, if it is a muon neutrino, then produce a muon, which uh, leaves a long uh, track, uh, track in the detector that uh, they, can, uh, they can see. Uh, the, what uh, we are more interested in is the astrophysical neutrinos that we can call for cosmic neutrino, which come from far away, uh, far away uh, galaxies. And uh, this neutrino uh, also interact, with, if it is a muon neutrino, interact with uh, the matter inside the detector or outside the detector, then produce a muon, which uh, and leaves a long track, which is seen in the detector, like, like this. Uh, so in this plot, you can see that uh, they, they observed that the uh, at atmospheric neutrinos. So these are the data for the atmospheric neutrinos of the new e and anti new e type. And this is for atmospheric neutrinos of new mu and uh, anti new mu type. So they can detect the uh, mu neutrinos through the track of the, of, the, of the muon that leaves a very long track in the detector. Uh, they take, can detect also uh, 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 electron neutrinos and uh, they can distinguish the, the two because uh, this electron neutrino, uh, when it interact, then uh, uh, produce electrons which produce a shower. So electrons interact very uh, quickly with uh, surrounding matters and they scatter around so they don't leave a long track as a muon but they, they, they just produce a, a, a wider shower. Uh, so, uh, sorry, tau neutrinos, uh, they cannot be seen directly, uh, it is very difficult to see them, uh, so uh, they also produce uh, showers, it's difficult to, to distinguish the shower produced by uh, tau neutrinos with, uh, from the shower produced by electron neutrinos. The, there is some possibility to, to see that through what is called the double bang, because uh, uh, when the tau neutrino interacts, produce a tau, so this uh, leaves a track, and then the tau decay and produce a, a shower. So if they can distinguish this feature, uh, then they can distinguish tau neutrinos. But so far, uh, this has not been done. <coughs> <laughs> I'm not <laughs> in the experiment, so I don't remember. I don't know. Uh, but uh, atmospheric neutrinos, many. No, I, I don't know, maybe some thousands, but I, I'm not sure about this number. But we are more interested uh, on the high energy neutrinos, which are here. So you can see that uh, the um, uh, spectrum of uh, atmospheric neutrinos has a power law. Uh, you, you, when, you, when you see an event, you cannot say, say if it is an atmospheric neutrino or a, a astrophysical cosmic neutrino. You can say it only because if you observe it at a, a larger energy above this power law spectrum. So if you observe an excess here, then you can say that this event is probably due to a, a cosmic neutrino. Otherwise, if uh, below, uh, in this region, you cannot distinguish the two. Uh, that is why all the events that they have, uh, they, they are, uh, for, uh, for the cosmic neutrinos, they are above this, uh, uh, this line, which is the power low spectrum of the atmospheric neutrinos. And for these cosmic neutrinos, the events are few. Well, uh, I think, uh, no, some information you can extract. For example, uh, an important information is that uh, the fact that uh, neutrinos were detected in association with gamma rays 
uh, indicate that the, the production is due to an hadronic interactions because uh, uh, gamma, uh, uh, typically, I mean, the most common model of hadronic interaction is that you have a beam of protons which is produced in this jet, which interact with the surrounding matter and produce pions. So pions uh, can produce when the charged pions, when they decay, they produce neutrinos, and neutral pions, they, they, they produce photons. So this, the fact that they observe neutrinos and gamma rays uh, indicates that this is the mechanism of production. Because otherwise, you, can, you, could, you could also have, for example, uh, some production of uh, neutrinos with other mechanisms that is, uh, in which you don't have uh, the, for the gamma ray production. Okay, and uh, so yeah, this is a, a, pl a plot which uh, uh, shows, yes. Oh, that is uh, maybe, that was 20 or 30, 20, about 20, I don't know. Putting all together, I, there were uh, about 10 events in Super Kamiokande and 10 events in IMB, more, more or less, now I don't remember how. Yes, but uh, those neutrinos are also cosmic neutrinos. I don't have time to, to talk about them. They are low energy neutrinos. So these are neutrinos at uh, energies about uh, between 10 and 20 or 30 MeV. So, and this were, came from the supernova. So here we are talking about uh, much higher energy neutrino. So you see that uh, the, the cut for uh, seeing this uh, in energy is uh, 200 TeV. So we are talking about hundreds of TeV or thousands of TeV of uh, energy of these neutrinos, which come from really far away distance. The distance estimated for this uh, observation uh, that was announced last, last week is uh, five uh, billion, four, I think four billion years, so light years. Uh, okay, this, uh, these are the events, uh, the astrophysical events which they observed, so you see that they are not many, uh, plotted in this uh, galactic map. Um, so this is a projection uh, in which the projection in which this uh, line is the galactic plane, this is a uh, star is the galactic center, and uh, since the Earth, Earth is uh, incl inclined with respect to the galactic uh, plane, the uh, Earth horizon is given by this uh, uh, dashed line here. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, the different uh, um, symbols uh, indicate a different uh, type of events. So this, uh, uh, this red one with a dot, uh, these are uh, high energy upgoing, upgoing tracks. So these are uh, events which are muon, muons which uh, are produced by neutrinos uh, in the matter outside the detector and they just pass through, through the detector. And uh, in this case, uh, one is interested in the, only in the upgoing ones because uh, uh, for the downgoing ones, uh, you, we, there are the muons which are produced by the cosmic ray muons that one cannot distinguish uh, from the neutrino produced muon. So these are not uh, interesting. Instead, uh, the upgoing uh, tracks, uh, they must be generated by neutrinos because uh, the cosmic ray muons are absorbed by the Earth. So only in the case of upgoing tracks, uh, they can uh, uh, um, identify these events with neutrino events. Uh, however, you can see that uh, this, uh, all these uh, upgoing tracks events, uh, they are just below the horizon. And the reason is that at uh, these very high energies, uh, the Earth is no longer transparent to the neutrinos. So yesterday I, I said that uh, uh, battery is trans practically transparent to the neutrinos, but uh, this uh, depends on the neutrino energy because the cross-section increases with energies. If you consider the solar neutrinos, which have an energy of a few MeV, then Earth is, and Sun is completely transparent. But when you go to this such high energy, then the, uh, the absorption becomes important. And here uh, you can see in this region, the absorption is more than 90% uh, for uh, uh, neutrinos with uh, uh, energy of more than 100 MeV. So they can observe this uh, 
uh, upgoing tract only uh, near, the, near the horizon. And then uh, they have a different uh, type of uh, uh, events, which are called this HESE event. These are, uh, HESE is an acronym for high energy starting events. And this is, these are events which start inside the detector. And this is important because uh, uh, then you can be sure that they are produced by neutrinos because uh, you, you see just a, a, some track which are, is starting inside the detector and you don't have a, a, a charged particle which produced it. So this must be a neutrino. And also you can uh, measure all the energy that which is deposited uh, in the detector. Uh, so you can correlate this, uh, measure the energy of the neutrino which produced uh, this uh, event. You cannot do that for the upgoing track because you don't know how much energy was lost outside of the detector. Instead, if you, all the track is inside the detector, you can determine the energy of, uh, of the neutrino. And uh, in this case, uh, this has uh, events. Uh, they are uh, uh, of uh, two types. One, one is also tracks, uh, and these are produced by mu neutrinos. And the other is uh, cascades, or called, called also showers. Uh, these are produced by electron neutrino and antineutrino, and, uh, and by tau uh, neutrino and antineutrinos. And also by neutral current events, which, uh, in which uh, all uh, neutrinos uh, participate. And so you can see that uh, there are several of them uh, here. And in this case, uh, one can also uh, is interested also from the events which come from above. Because uh, as I said, the, the, the starting of the track is uh, just inside the detector. So this, uh, for sure, are not uh, cosmic ray uh, muons or, or other uh, cosmic rays. Uh, OK, this is an uh, uh, interesting point. And uh, here also you can see that uh, there are four, four events with the numbers. And these are the numbers of the most energetic events. And you can see this is uh, around 4,000 PV. So this is uh, what is called 4 P PV. Uh, one important, uh, interesting question from our point of view uh, is the uh, flavor composition of the neutrinos. Uh, which is uh, so correlated to what I said before about the determination of the mixing matrix elements. So uh, there are several possible mechanisms of production of, uh, of uh, the neutrinos. And uh, in this uh, different mechanism, the flavor composition of the neutrino at the source is different. Uh, and then, uh, but what we measure is the flavor composition uh, at the earth. And the two are uh, uh, related by the uh, uh, oscillation probability from the uh, source to the earth. So here you can see that uh, the different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, processes, there are more, but these are the most common considered, uh, that can produce the neutrinos and uh, how they uh, 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 what is the different composition in terms of, uh, uh, of the different flavors. So the most common, uh, favored uh, common mechanism is this uh, pion and muon decay, that, uh, as I de uh, described before. Uh, in this case, uh, one has a production of, uh, so a one-third of uh, uh, electron neutrino and two-third of muon neutrino. Uh, in the pion only decay, so if the muon decay is suppressed, is suppressed maybe because the muon are absorbed or they lose energy, then you have only pion decay and then you have uh, only production of muon neutrinos. In the, in the case of charmed meson decay, then uh, you have a, a, a practically electron and muon neutrinos are produced in the same, uh, with the same probability, so you have one half and one half. And in the case, instead of neutron decay, then you have a production of uh, uh, only electron uh, uh, neutrinos. Uh, then uh, you can connect the, uh, uh, these uh, uh, fractions of the different flavors, uh, which, uh, which is in the source, to the one of the Earth, just by making, cal making this uh, calculation with the uh, transition probabilities. Now you remember that uh, when you uh, explained that when you go very far from the source, uh, you cannot measure the oscillation. So what you, you observe is only the average oscillations, uh, the average, average transitions, sorry. 
Uh, and this uh, does not depend on the daytime square. So the average uh, transition probabilities are just determined by the uh, elements of the mixing matrix. And the elements of the mixing matrix in the first approximation are uh, given by this uh, simple expression. But uh, here, uh, we uh, connecting to what I said before, uh, it's important to measure accurately the elements of the mixing matrix in, in, in order to have a better determination of this uh, uh, transformation uh, probability and uh, a better uh, correlate, a better uh, calculation of the uh, amount of the flavor observed on the earth with respect to the flavor uh, which was in the source. And uh, the uh, the, this percentage of flavors, they are uh, represented typically in these uh, tri triangles. These triangles, uh, maybe at first sight, uh, they are a little bit uh, difficult to read. And uh, they use the fact that, of course, uh, uh, since the, the sum of these this three uh, fractions must be equal to one, so uh, if you take any point inside the triangle, the distance of this, the, the sum of the distances of this point to the, to the uh, sides is equal to one. So you can uh, uh, represent graf graphically this uh, three fraction as a, uh, as a point in this uh, triangle. And uh, when you, uh, how you read uh, this uh, triangle, the amount of, uh, for example, of tau uh, fraction is uh, given by this uh, blue blue line. So you you read the the amount of tau fraction in this uh, direction. So this is a maximal. So this is pure new tau. And you, if you go in this direction, you go to zero here. For the for the mu is uh, in this direction, and for the e is in this direction. So you can see that uh, if we consider the uh, some three of these uh, cases, which are which is the uh, pion and muon decay. So this is the first case. The uh, at the source, the uh, flavor composition is uh, represented by by this point, and then uh, by uh, making this uh, transformation uh, of the probability to the earth. Do you reach one reach the this point which give the flavor composition on the earth? Uh, this is the case of uh, muon suppressed uh, pion decay. So this is the, what is called here pion only decay. So you start from here because you have only muon neutrino, and then in the earth you end here in this point. And uh, for the uh, neutron decay, you start with a pure uh, electron neutrino, and then you end here in, in this point. So you can see that uh, the points which are expected in any case, they are aligned along this uh, line. And the, the reason why they are aligned, uh, aligned along this line is that this uh, corresponds to the mu tau uh, um, uh, symmetry of the mixing matrix. So, so the, since uh, there is a mu tau symmetry, uh, the uh, result of this oscillation is to align all these points along this line. But uh, this mu tau symmetry probably is not exact. So the, uh, if you future experiment will determine better the mixing parameters, then one can determine some uh, where exactly this point uh, uh, go uh, after the uh, uh, propagation on the Earth. And uh, there is a very nice paper by these three people uh, uh, some about three years ago, in which uh, they calculated the allowed region uh, of, uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, of, of the flavor composition uh, on the Earth, uh, independently of of any uh, mechanism. So for any possible mechanism. Uh, they found that uh, given the, uh, the value of the mixing parameters that was known at this time, the result, uh, the, the, the flavor composition must lie in this, uh, in this uh, region, which is the orange, uh, orange one. You can see here what is the uh, result of the fit of the ice cube data. The best fit is here. So the best fit is uh, rather far from, uh, from the... Uh, 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 allow the region here. So this uh, uh, point uh, 
if the best fit is correct, this point to the existence of some exotic uh, new physics. Uh, but uh, one cannot say anything for sure because uh, in any case the uncertainty is large. So at one sigma, this region is allowed. Uh, in this plot here, they distinguish, uh, they make a distinction about the uh, different possible mechanisms that, uh, that are uh, uh, possible. And you can see that uh, according to the mechanism, then one can restrict the, uh, the region that you expect uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a more precise way. And uh, this is the, uh, you see the, these uh, dashed lines are the, uh, show the sensitivity of what is called ice cube generation two. So ice cube now is uh, making a extension, uh, and uh, they will of course uh, have more data, more. Uh, and uh, in that case, they will they can uh, find a, a, a region which is determine better what you, the, the the allowed region than, than what it is now, because now you can see the, from this data the uncertainties are rather large. Here. Ah, if they will found something here, this will be very strange because you can see this uh, uh, this region is obtained by using standard oscillations varying only the origin, the production mechanism. And uh, if you find that the allowed region is here, then it means that uh, you need something, some uh, non-standard oscillations or something like that. Uh, Non-standard oscillations are possible. Uh, so in, in this other plot, they consider it some general uh, form, some general structure of uh, uh, transitions, which uh, I don't remember which are the constraints, but are more general than the standard one. And still, they cannot reach this point. So uh, as far as I remember, in their com they conclude that uh, if the region uh, is in this point, one needs really something very strange, like a Lorentz violation or CPT violation, something really uh, very exotic. Uh, uh, yes, a, 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 a interesting uh, point is that uh, uh, there is a way to, distingu to distinguish the uh, electron antineutrinos from the others. Uh, due to this uh, glacial resonance, which uh, uh, is a resonance in the interaction of the electron antineutrinos with uh, electrons, uh, which happens when the, the uh, transfer momentum is equal to the W mass, so you have a resonance in the cross section. Uh, and this happens to the, uh, at an energy of 6.32 PeV. So this is uh, 6032 uh, PeV. Uh, this is a, a extremely high energy. Uh, you can see here the uh, <coughs> uh, peak of the glacial resonance with respect to the normal cross-section. So if you go far from the peak, then the interaction of, of neutrinos with elect, uh, neutri antineutrinos with electrons is uh, not a dominant process, but it is uh, the interaction with uh, the nucleon, no, nucleons that is dominant. But in the peak, uh, this uh, it gives an, a strong enhancement of this uh, cross-section. And uh, if one observes some uh, a peak of event around this uh, 6.3 PeV, then one can uh, say that uh, probably these events were due to electron uh, antineutrinos. Um, at the time in which uh, these papers were written, it was 2014. Then uh, the ice cube data have, uh, had only events with a maximum energy of 2 PV. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, so one, of course, uh, uh, I mean, the amount, the amount of uh, uh, neutrinos which can be detected depends on the cross section and also of the flux. The flux uh, typically has uh, some power law with a spectral index gamma. And uh, in the standard mechanism of, uh, of production, the, this uh, spectral index is expected to be uh, two, exactly two. Uh, 
based on this data and on the fact that at that time there was no event with, uh, which could be, which uh, lied uh, above 2 PV, so there, there was not a no event at 6 PV, they concluded that uh, the uh, index, uh, uh, spectral index must be bigger than the 2.3 at 90 percent. So uh, it is, should be bigger than this uh, standard, uh, standard one. However, uh, more recently, they, uh, they, uh, they uh, measured uh, 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 at least one event, which is shown here, uh, with a, uh, a, a, an energy of about 7 PV. So this is a candidate for an event due to the glacial resonance. Uh, here you can see that uh, the event is, uh, OK, it is this line, but uh, uh, it is difficult to determine exactly the energy, so they have a uh, distribution of energy distribution for this event, but this event is uh, compatible with a, uh, with a uh, event due to the gas resonance. And uh, according to this paper, uh, then uh, now the uh, uh, cosmic neutrino flux is well described by a power law with spectral instance 2.19 plus or minus 0.10. So, this is compatible with a standard uh, uh, number, uh, spectral index of two within two sigma. And uh, in the recent, uh, uh, so this is a paper which is a review paper by Alzer and others in, the, in May. In, uh, in the neutrino conference, they presented this slide in which uh, uh, they say there is uh, also an event at uh, 6.3 PV. I don't know if it is uh, the same, but uh, I just show you this uh, slide because uh, it is, in any case, there's a, a nice slide which uh, shows the, uh, uh, how they observe this event in the, in the, in the scoop detector, and this is also the uh, cross-section for the, for the glacial resonance. So this is an uh, interesting argument that will be developed more in the near future. So this is a real hot topic. So uh, going now back to the determination of the neutrino mixing parameters, uh, uh, important uh, determination is also uh, the CP phase. For the CP phase, uh, I don't say much because uh, Professor Banco will say probably more about that. I only want to note that uh, uh, we expect that uh, there is CP violation, but even if uh, uh, data will exclude CP violation and they, they will find CP conservation, then this will be an inter important uh, information because then one will need to explain why there is a, uh, this CP conservation, conservation may be due to, to a new symmetry. But uh, more generally, people expect that there is CP violation, and in particular, this will be used use for the process of leptogenesis uh, that uh, uh, can explain the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Uh, so I don't have time to discuss that. And, and I just move to the, the discussion of the determination of the absolute scale of neutrino masses. So, so far, I discussed the uh, result of oscillation experiments, which determine the difference of the, the delta m square, so the difference of the square of the neutrino masses. We don't know what is the absolute scale, but we have some, uh, indicate, some results, uh, namely upper limits. But uh, also from the, uh, from the fact that we, can, we know what are the delta m square, we can, we can uh, uh, study what are the different possibilities for the, uh, for the different neutrino masses. And uh, to do that, uh, it is uh, uh, useful to uh, consider as a uh, free parameter one of the mass, uh, one of the masses. And uh, uh, in particular, it is useful to consider as free parameter the lightest mass, uh, that is m1 in the uh, normal ordering, and it is m3 in the inverted ordering. Then if one considers this as a free parameter, one can determine the other two masses because we know what are the delta m squares. So these are the simple equations which allow that. So we can study what are, the, what, is, what are the values of the different masses as a function of this uh, free parameter, which establish the scale of the neutrino masses. Uh, and this is shown in this plot, 
So in this plot, you can see that uh, if uh, M1 is uh, very small, then we have uh, what is called a mass hierarchy in the normal case. So M3 is much larger than M2, much larger than M1. So this is a logarithmic scheme. Uh, but as M1 uh, goes bigger and uh, it reaches uh, some scale or some fraction of electron volt, then we have a first a quasi-degenerate of M1 of M2, and then at a scale of some uh, here, we have a practically uh, a degeneracy of the three masses. This is a quasi-degenerate, so in, the, in this plot they appear to be equal, but this is simply due to the logarithmic scale, because... Uh, uh, in any case, they must have the uh, splitting, which generated the solar and atmospheric delta M square, but one cannot see it in this plot. Uh, in the case of the uh, inverted ordering, uh, the situation is different here, because you can see that uh, uh, N1 and N2, they are always, uh, uh, the difference between the two is always the solar delta M square, so this is the, the, the small one. So these two are all always uh, quasi-degenerate in this kind of plot, and uh, M3 can be much lighter here. As we reach some uh, scale of a fraction of electron volt, here the quasi-degenerate uh, scenario is similar to in, 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 the two, in the two schemes. And uh, here, by comparison, I also put uh, some uh, limit, uh, the limit that uh, uh, is obtained currently on the determination of the neutrino mass. So this is a limit that I will discuss in the next slide, which is obtained from the Troitsk and the Mainz experiment. Uh, and it is about uh, two electron volt. So you can see that uh, the limit is uh, not in this interesting region in which uh, there is a difference, but it is in the quasi-degenerate region. Uh, another experiment, uh, which is uh, just uh, started to take data, will uh, push this limit to about 0.2 electron volt, so they will be sensitive to, to this region. And uh, at, the pro at the moment, uh, there is no experiment which is foreseen uh, to, to go below this region. I mean, experiment with, uh, which can be done on Earth in the laboratory. From uh, cosmological data that we will see, as we will see in the uh, uh, lectures uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, uh, there is a very strong limit. So from the uh, latest uh, Planck data and uh, with other uh, cosmological data, there is a limit which is uh, about uh, uh, at, at this level. So you can see that it is much stronger than the uh, current laboratory limit and also of the uh, uh, catering sens sensitivity. So this means that uh, cosmology uh, give us an indication that uh, neutrino masses are very small, but uh, uh, cosmology has a lot of assumptions. So, and uh, this uh, cosmological result uh, is uh, very interesting and uh, it must be explored, but uh, it depends on the cosmological model. And we don't also have uh, control on the uh, condition on the, in the early universe. So, uh, this, the fact that uh, there is a very strong cosmological limit uh, does not mean that uh, this kind of measurement on the Earth are useless, because uh, we need uh, some uh, precise and uh, uh, reliable measurement on the Earth to find what are the, the neutrino masses. Uh, so the way in which uh, these uh, experiments or, or in the laboratory they can measure the neutrino mass, the best way is uh, by looking at tritium beta decay, this is the decay of tritium into helium and produce electron and the antineutrino. Uh, one cannot see the antineutrino. What one can see is the, uh, is the electron. So the measurement is done on the uh, energy spectrum of the electron. Uh, and uh, what is measured is the kinetic energy of the electron, which is not denoted by T here. And this is the uh, differential decay rate which uh, depends on the several known quantities. So this is the Kabibo angle, this is the Fermi constant, this is the nuclear matrix element, and this is uh, some, um, what is called Fermi function, which uh, uh, modify the, uh, take into account of the Coulomb interaction of the electrons with the, fine, with the helium nucleus. Uh, this is the, um, 
momentum of the electron, and this is the energy of the electron. And this is what is uh, called the Curie function, which is uh, what is uh, the interesting part, because the, the Curie function contains the effect of the neutrino mass. So the neutrino mass is here. Uh, in this notation here, uh, Q is the so-called Q value, and this is uh, the maximal value of the, uh, uh, the, the, of the energy of uh, the electron in the case of which, uh, in which the uh, neutrino mass is zero. And this is just given by this uh, difference of masses uh, in the process. So you can see here that uh, in this uh, uh, plot here that uh, if the neutrino mass is zero, then the Curie function is a straight line which ends in the Q value. So the spectrum of the electron uh, must, must end at the Q value. If uh, the uh, neutrino have a mass, so not all the energy can, can go to the, uh, not all the Q energy can go to the electron kinetic energy, but some energy must be spent to give mass to the neutrino. So the spectrum of the electron must be cut at Q minus uh, the neutrino mass. So the experiments, they are just uh, trying to look at uh, this end point of the spectrum uh, and uh, uh, find some difference between uh, a curve which goes like this or a curve which goes like this in order to uh, measure the neutrino mass. Uh, uh, it seems a very easy thing to do, but it is very difficult. And the problem is that uh, uh, this is the end point of the spectrum. So the majority of the events that they have are here. So here you, you see there are very, very few events. So they, they need a, uh, uh, to a special equipment to, uh, to detect just a few events at the end point of the spectrum. And the current uh, <coughs> bound from main St. Troy's, this, uh, this is a German experiment, this is a Russian experiment, it's about 2.2 electron volt. And uh, as I said before, in the future, now cutting uh, just started now, and uh, they will push this bound to about 0.2 electron volt. Now, in this plot, I did not uh, consider neutrino mixing. And, uh, somebody should have uh, asked me why. Uh, because here I put uh, the mass of the electron neutrino. Uh, this is wrong. As I explained before, the electron neutrino is not, is, does not have a definite mass. It is a superposition of massive neutrinos. So in the case of uh, uh, neutrino mix, uh, of the mixing, the expression for the Curie function is more complicated, uh, which is written here. So one has a contribution of uh, all the massive neutrinos here. Uh, and uh, each, uh, uh, the contribution of each one of them is weighted by the corresponding element of the mixing matrix, uh, which connect it uh, with uh, the electron. Uh, so uh, the, the curve is a rather complicated one, depends on several parameters. Uh, this is an illustration of what happens in the case of two neutrino mixing, which is the simplest one. Uh, this is only some for illustration. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see that uh, uh, if, uh, uh, the, uh, so the, if the neutrinos are mass, then the, the, you have still the blue line, which ends in the, in the Q. If uh, uh, then uh, uh, the uh, neutrino, the, the, the neutrino are, are massive, the end point of the spectrum is a Q minus M1. So in this, uh, in this region here, uh, the uh, energy uh, Q minus T is uh, uh, so small that it allows only the production of new one, which is the lightest neutrino. So in this uh, uh, region here, nu2 cannot be produced because there is no enough energy. So nu2 can be produced at uh, below Q minus M2. So at this point, uh, there is what is called a kink of the spectrum, so some uh, distortion of the spectrum, which corresponds to the, to the other mass. So in principle, if one can uh, measure uh, uh, precisely this uh, spectrum and find uh, these kinks, uh, then one can pre measure precisely all the neutrino masses. But uh, this is a, a very difficult measurement that maybe we done in the future, but not in the near future. And uh, there is no experiment which is planning to do that. At present, uh, what we, we have is only upper bound for the neutrino mass. In the, this means that uh, we cannot uh, distinguish this uh, structure. So we cannot distinguish the different masses. 
And in that case, one can uh, make an approximation of this uh, uh, equation uh, considering uh, the, all the masses uh, smaller than Q minus T. So Q minus T is the order of magnitude of the energy resolution of the detector. And uh, it is uh, easy, as it is shown here, uh, to show that uh, then when you make uh, this uh, approximation, then you can compatify all the, the effect of all the neutrino masses in an effective uh, electron neutrino mass, uh, M beta here, uh, which is given by this expression. So this M beta is uh, similar to this uh, uh, effective neutrino mass here, because it appears, okay, it appears exactly in the same way inside the, the Curie plot. So at present, we have only information in this, on this M beta, which is given by this expression. And in particular, we, have, uh, we know that M beta must be uh, smaller than about two uh, electron volts. So this is uh, the, the plot for M beta. Uh, and uh, what we uh, can uh, predict, uh, I mean, we can imagine that uh, we can calculate can happen as a function of, again, as I, I, I did in the previous plot, of the uh, an unknown uh, parameter, which is the uh, minimal mass, uh, uh, which is M1 in the normal ordering and M3 in the inverted ordering. So this is a plot of what we expect from for M beta in, the, in these two cases, the inverted ordering and the normal ordering. Uh, you see here there is the quasi-degenerate region, and then the, the, in this uh, hierarchical region, the behavior of M beta in the, in the two cases, inverted or normal order, is, is rather different. And the reason is that uh, uh, because uh, in the inverted ordering, you remember that uh, this uh, new one and new two, they are the heaviest neutrinos, and uh, this uh, uh, they, they are also the ones that have the largest mixing with the with the electron with electron neutrinos. So they give a, a dominant contribution, and we expect that the uh, scale of the uh, M beta in the inverted organic scale is uh, more or less of the square of the atmospheric uh, uh, daytime square. In the same, in, instead, in the case of the normal ordering, the situation is not so good because. Uh, uh, in, the, in this case, uh, um, the heaviest neutrino is M3, but uh, uh, we know that uh, theta 1, 3 is small, so UE3 is small. So the effect of uh, uh, M3, which is the heaviest, is suppressed by the small mixing angle uh, theta 1, 3. So we expect that uh, here uh, the M beta is, uh, is uh, smaller. So in this case, if we are in this region, it will be very difficult uh, for uh, future experiment to observe the, the neutrino mass. The current uh, uh, bound are uh, farther from this region, and uh, they are uh, shown here. Um, I have now the topic of neutrino less w beta decay, but I think uh, my time is over, so I will do, do it tomorrow. Okay, maybe next time. Thank yes. you very much. Okay. Just one information. Uh, these uh, lectures are being transmitted directly from YouTube in the CBPF conference. So, the, all this, okay? Sigiano.
Sí. No sé. Aquí está. Deixa eu ver uma coisa aqui. Põe lá, 31. Desce aqui. É. Ah, não. É. Aí. Isso, isso. Obrigado. So, before we start uh, Nelson's uh, second lecture, I have two announcements. One is that this, this meeting is being webcast uh, um, online. So if you check your YouTube, look for CBPF, that's the first uh, answer that comes up. So behave, right? Everybody's watching, right? And do ask, ask, ask questions, right? Your advisors are watching, and your future advisors are uh, watching as well, OK? And the second an announcement is just to remind you that tomorrow afternoon is going to after the last lecture, we're going to have this. Uh, and that's great. And uh, everything's going to happen here. Just fine. So everything's going to happen here, right? OK, so tomorrow afternoon, after the last lecture, don't leave. OK. So Nelson, please. OK, thank you. So le let me continue what I was talking to you uh, last lecture. Uh, I, I will introduce the subject of uh, quantum cosmological perturbations. And I think uh, Robert will go into detail tomorrow. So, But I have to talk about this, because this is the subject of my talk. I'll try to sketch the main lines of these things. And I'll talk about this very important uh, issue is the quantum to classical transition of this quantum cosmological perturbation. So as you have seen in the, the, the Robert lectures, uh, the metric perturbations can be described by a single field, which is this phi field here, okay, that appears here in the metric, depends on x, at it is conformal time. And uh, so there is also the scalar field perturbation here. And turns out that the, the, the good variable to, to describe everything and to be quantized is a so-called mukhanov sozak variable, which is a combination of this phi and delta phi in this way. Phi prime is the, the background field, scalar field. Age is the Hubble, the Hubble parameter. And this can be written in terms of the curvature perturbation in this way. And I will define this background quantity as z here. Uh, so now, if you take the, the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian the, the, for general relativity and we, we plug uh, the perturbed, uh, at the perturbed level, go to perturbed level, and then we can show that this uh, general relativity action goes to this form here. Okay. And uh, if you uh, calculate the equation of motions for the modes, the equation of motion is this one here. This is the sound speed maybe one or less, and this is this background variable here. Okay? So these are the classical equations of motions for the modes. Okay? Now, if you want to quantize it, then uh, let us see what we can do. I think. Yes, yes, yes. What do you mean by the right variable to quantize? Yeah, it's, it's a variable that uh, you you turn out to obtain Hamiltonian formalism where it is a, is a, it's in canonical form, then uh, you, you have all the canonical uh, relations, usually canonical relations, in order to, to quantize everything. Okay? Um, it's, a, it's also a gauge invariant variable also. Okay? It's gauge invariant. So whatever is the, 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 the infinitesimal, the, uh, infinitesimal coordinate transformation that you make, they will be the same, OK? It's also gauge invariant. So in a sense that the canonical, uh, canonical commutators are the usual one. Uh, so now, if I quantize, then uh, so this is linear perturbation theory. So 
I will write the, the wave function uh, as a product of mode wave functions in this way. And as it's linear, they do not interfere with each other. I can separate in this way. Uh, and then, if you now calculate the Schrodinger equation using this calculated Hamiltonian from here, then you can calculate the, 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 the Schrodinger equation. And this is the Schrodinger equation here for each mode. And now, if uh, as you see, uh, the, the, usual idea, uh, the usual idea is that either in inflation or in bouncing models, uh, you have a situation where the, the wavelengths are much smaller than the Hubble radius. Uh, and so at this time, you can, all, the, 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 for the perturbations, just, just see almost a Minkowski space time. And then you assume that they are, uh, they are just vacuum fluctuations. And then we impose vacuum, uh, a vacuum state for them. And that's the thing we do here. So suppose, so uh, we define the, 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 the the wave function for the vacuum state in this way, which is a solution of this equation here. And if you calculate this, this can be calculated. Solution of this is satisfy this. Uh, this is the wave function here. So this is V, the, 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 parameter, the, the parameter here. And these are functions of time here, which appear, which appear because the, 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 the model, the, you know, the background is, uh, 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 is dynamical. It depends on time. So this is a function of time, which satisfies this equation here, which is exactly the classical equation. Now, what will be the initial condition in order for this uh, really be uh, 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 describe a vacuum wave function? Well, we see that when the background is almost static, or if this term here is negligible compared with this term here, then this is just a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And then in this situation, when, the, when this happens, we can then say that in this situation, F behaves like this. And of course, if you, can ins if you insert this in this wave function, then we will obtain that uh, at, the, uh, at this level, uh, Psi is just the ground state wave function for the harmonic oscillator. You see there's this term here, and this is the Gaussian, usual Gaussian for the for the wave, ground state of wave function of the harmonic oscillator. And uh, we know that uh, uh, people say, well, the, the fluctuations of the, uh, the same B are nearly Gaussian. And so this corroborates uh, this approach that, well, uh, the origin of them are from quantum vacuum fluctuations. And the, quant and the distribution in Q of the quantum vacuum fluctuations is a Gaussian. So everything is consistent with this. Uh, okay, so this is the wave function for the vacuum state. Now, what is the problem here? Okay. Huh? Now, this, uh, the, uh, the, usually these initial conditions in inflation are put when the wavelengths are much smaller than the Hubble radius. So for, for all wavelengths, which are much smaller than the Hubble radius. Then eventually, they will increase, okay, and then they will be bigger than the Hubble radius, and then that's the thing I'll talk now, okay? Uh, uh, in two slides, I'll talk about what happens afterwards. But the initial conditions are put when, uh, uh, that, um, well, when the, 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 the wavelengths are really much smaller than the Hubble radius, which happens during inflation. Okay, so, but the problem is that, first, the vacuum state is homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, even the V square, the mean value of V square is homogeneous and isotropic. Because, well, if T is uh, the transition operator and va the vacuum is invariant by that, then you put, if you put here, you can see that V square is, is uh, the mean value of V square is equal to the mean value of V square plus delta. Uh, also, then, if you write down, remember that the equation that I put uh, some uh, yesterday, the fluctuation of the plant temperature is related to this quantity here, which in turn is related to this, this quantity here, psi. And as Robert told us, this psi here is the metric fluctuation, in, in, in which case, uh, if the, uh, the, 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 the energy momentum tensor has no anisotropic pressure, 
psi is exactly equal to phi. So the metric perturbation, which now, remember that I am quantizing everything, which now is, comes from a quantum description, uh, the, it gives this alpha here, which in turn gives this delta t over t. Now, what do, do we put in place of phi or psi? We put the mean value, but the mean value is zero. Mean value is zero because if you are in the vacuum state, psi, if you spend this in terms of uh, declination and, uh, and uh, uh, creation and integration operators, if you calculate the mean value, it's zero. So what, I put a realization. What do, what do we do with this? Well, uh, the, usual, the, the usual attempt to solve this problem is by saying that, well, uh, during either an inflation or in a contracting phase, the, this vacuum state is squeezing. As it is squeezing, uh, they give rise to a positive Wigner distribution in phase space. And this quantum distribution looks, like, looks very much like a classical stochastic distribution of realizations of the universe with different inhomogeneous configurations. And the coherence should avoid interference among these realizations. Okay. So uh, as the, the state evolves, okay, they will give rise to this, uh, uh, this classical stochastic distribution of realizations with different homogeneous configurations, and they do not interfere. However, this is still, there is still the same problem as before. The measuring problem is still here. Because, and this attempt is, was severely criticized by many authors, by Leif, Lido, Mukhanov, Sudars, Weinberg, by saying that it's not sufficient. The state is, first the state is still homogeneous isotropic. And then, for the coherence, you usually need an environment in order to make the coherence. But what is the environment of the perturbations in the universe? There are some attempts, there are no agreement what should be the environment, so it's, uh, people don't, don't, really don't know their proposal, but no one I agree with one single proposal. And then, third, in the study interpretation, these different realizations, different potentialities, are not realities. They are just potentialities. So how one of the potentialities become a real universe? This is the same problem as the, 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 the cat and the dead, are dead, and, dead and alive cat. So the wave function bifurcate in dead and alive cat, OK, there is no interference between them. Between them but how you select one of these possibilities? Then people evoke the, the collapse of the wave function, uh, and the collapse of the wave function is usually uh, given by some observer outside the system. But now, uh, who, who makes the role, what makes the role of a measurement in the early universe? Well, it cannot be us. We cannot collapse the wave function of the universe because we cannot exist without stars. In order to have stars, we have to have this collapse before. So it cannot be us. So what do you do with this? So this is a problem that is raised by many authors that there is no solution if you stay within the standard interpretation. Now, if you go to the broad interpretation, then this is, the, the solution is exactly the same as the solution of the, uh, of the measurement problem. Uh, the existence of an actual field configuration breaks the translation and rotation invariance. So among the many possibilities that uh, the fluctuations, the, the uh, many, many different possible universes that you might have, there is one actual field configuration which will select one of them, will go into one of them, depending on the initial conditions, and will select this possibility among the others. And it will break the, uh, tra uh, the translation and rotation and invariance that we had before, in the same way as here, as I explained before. Now, as the state satisfies the Schoenner equation, the Born, as I told you, the Born rule applies. So all the distribution goes to satisfy the Born, the Born rule, which says that the probability to find the, the field in some configuration is psi square. And because well, we are dealing with the, the broadly Born uh, theory, then it obeys some guidance equations. So what are these guidance equations? So this is the wave function, as I wrote before. OK. This is the phase, OK? Here is that the momentum should be equal to the gradient of the phase, but the, mo oh, I'm sorry. The momentum is just, it's not just the velocity because the Lagrangian, there is this term here, so it's not just, it's not just the velocity. So there is the evolution for V and the evolution for, for the V star, v, the complex curvature V. 
And taking this action, uh, this phase, and, uh, and these equations here, we can really integrate. And you can see that V, the, the, the quantum evolution of the perturbation, is related to this F that I wrote before in this way. Note that F satisfies the classical equation, so F is the classical perturbation, and V is the quantum one. So how they become classical? So, so this is the solution. F is the classical one, and V is the quantum one. So let us take the, the, the moment where k squared is much bigger than z2 prime over z. Uh, and in this situation, the solution of, for f is just an oscillator. For this situation, k squared much bigger than z2 prime over z is for eta very big. And so this is a small uh, modification. So f is just, an, uh, is just oscillating. But now you plug this here, then you can see that v is, will be almost a constant. So they are very different solutions. So this is really quantum behavior, and this is the classical behavior. So this, in this situation, uh, the fluctuations behave as really quantum mechanically. Now, if k squared is much bigger than z2 prime over z, where really the dynamics of the, of the universe becomes important, which is a situation where the, 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 the physical wavelengths become much bigger than the Hubble radius, then the solution for f usually have a, a, a decay in a growing mode, and after some time, the growing mode will dominate. So it's just a, a, a function of a growing mode in this way, a power law. Usually it's like this, even inflation or bouncing models. Now, if you plug this here, then you see that V will be, which is this, is just pro, it's the same function of eta as F, so we recover the, the classical limit. And it's quite interesting because uh, uh, this analysis, because there are some recent papers by Jean Martin, Vincent Vernin, where they try, where they try to find uh, quantum signs of uh, these perturbations in CMB, uh, and they have shown that it's very difficult to find because uh, they, they they could only find the sign, the quantum sign of uh, these perturbations, Quant, uh, a quantum sign of, of quantum evolution in the same B, uh, if the, the decay mode was, was not so small. Um, any sign depends on the decay mode, and as the decay mode is very small, we cannot see anything. So these works agree with our interpretation, which says that, uh, that because the decay mode is negligible, then the, uh, the, 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 the perturbations behave classically when uh, you, when we get the expanding phase after inflation or after a bounce, okay. uh, so another and the statistic is well in the Broglie bomb. So if you want to calculate the two-point function, so this I'm uh, sorry, this should be v, not y. <laughs> anyway, this is v, okay, and other thing is v. Uh, so uh, the statistic so just integrate respect to the, the, the initial conditions, uh, which in the end is the same as the usual expression for the correlation function, and then uh, it gives the usual expression as before, okay? So well, what, I, what I was trying to say is that, so in, uh, with assuming this de Broglie bond theory, you can understand quite well uh, this transition from quantum to classical behavior, and this is mainly uh, uh, because you have a growing mode and the decay mode is very negligible with respect to this growing mode. Note that if these two things are comparable, then if you put it here, then V will not be the same, will not have the same behavior of F as F. Okay. So there is some question about this, then I will move to other subjects. That uh, is? Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's mainly caution. The non-gaussian comes only afterwards when, uh, when, the, well, when comes non-linearities, and then the non-gaussians come on this way, but still gaussian. Okay, so let, let me now go to 
So uh, what I was talking about was quantum cosmological perturbations in classical backgrounds. Now, I, uh, in the uh, last lecture, I present to you some quantum backgrounds where there are no singularities. What happens with quantum cos cosmological perturbations in quantum backgrounds? Uh, so it's a step forward uh, in many things that people do, uh, people have done before, uh, and all this guy. So uh, I will just take, uh, so just a simple scalar field, a canonical scalar field, set squared is equal to one. I will define W as P over rho. Uh, then, now what, what I'm doing now is that I'll take the Hamiltonian of general relativity, okay? And I expand in a zero order Hamiltonian and a second order Hamiltonian, which describes the perturbations. Uh, and so uh, this is the, the total Hamiltonian. And due to the quantization, it is a constraint. It must annihilate the wave function. And so this equation here becomes this equation here, which this is the Hamiltonian for the background with back, uh, background variables. And this is Hamiltonian for the perturbation is the second order Hamiltonian. And this should annihilate uh, Psi. I will assume that uh, Psi can be separated in this way, a, a background wave function and a se second order wave function. So we plug this here, then we obtain zero order equations, which gives H0 Psi 0 equals zero. Then I can solve this equation and using the guidance relations, which are which I described before in this way, okay, with alpha equal log of A, then you can have the background. And one of the backgrounds that I told you is this one here. For, then I will show afterwards a solution with, uh, with the potential not zero. Okay? In fact, of the exponential potential. Yes, 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 yes. They are not really coupled together. Yeah, in order to, to have a, a solution, we have to give initial conditions for Psi and initial conditions for the guidance equations. If you give initial conditions for Psi, then you can solve for Psi. If you solve for Psi, and then you have the phase, and then you can... And what do you do? You solve first the yes. equation for Psi and then for S? Yeah. No, no, I solve the equation for Psi. And then I get, I get, uh, I take S the phase, and then I, I put in the, the, the in the guidance equations, guidance relations. Okay. Well, there, there are some people that use all this, this De Broglie-Bohm approach in order to make uh, numerical correlation very first by doing something different. But anyway, it's another. Uh, if someone asks me in the end, I can, I can tell you about that. So this, uh, this is the background, okay? Uh, note that this solution is very similar than to the one that was found uh, seven years afterwards uh, by the people of Luke Quantum Cosmology. We, they have more or less the same thing. They have a scalar field with zero potential and they found a solution exactly like that. It's contracted classically, then there is a bounce and then expands. Uh, so even using a different Techniques of low quantum cosmology, this uh, solution was obtained some 70 years after. Uh, okay, so what happens at second order? Now, this, uh, this, uh, uh, remember that I told, I told you about this uh, conditional wave function? And uh, we use this, this, this idea here. So we'll define the conditional wave function, which is, comes from just the Psi 2. Uh, how? So we just substitute the background solution, alpha of eta, v, phi of eta here, and then we obtain the so-called conditional wave function, which now depends only on the conformal time and on the perturbation. Now, if you insert in the equations that appear naturally from uh, the second order, there is a term like this, which we can uh, expand in this way, and due to the guidance relations, they are just this thing here, and this is just the, 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 the partial derivative of psi with respect to eta, eta. Then, after some manipulations, we get exactly the same, the same Schrodinger equation, 
But now the z here is not the classical z, it's not the class for the classical background, is the z of the quantum background. And you were able to obtain exactly this equation here. Uh, now, for the modes, you have this, and then now the background is a bouncing model. So you have, again, uh, this picture. Uh, so this is the rubber radius. These are the wavelengths. And you see in the contracting phase, uh, the wavelengths are much smaller than the rubber radius. This is exactly the situation where this term here is much bigger than this term here. Okay. Then they cross the rubber radius. They cross when this, this ter these two terms are equal. Uh, and then there is an amplification of the perturbations. There's the bounce. And then again, there's expanding phase. And then they again become smaller than the Hubble radius. Uh, so you're using canonical scalar field. So this S square here from now on is equal to 1. But you have, we have, we have also work with uh, fluid with set square not equal 1. But I'm not sure it's here. And for gravitational waves, it's the same equation, but you have to substitute the V here by this quantity mi, which is A times the, the amplitude of the gravitational wave. And you have to substitute the Z here just by A, the scale factor. The, the equation for gravitational waves, you have to make these substitutions here. Now, so if you calculate everything, then you can see that uh, defining W equal P over rho, that the spectral index, given that you have vacuum initial conditions, okay, the spectral index is just a function of this W here. And this W here is the equation of state of the, of the fluid, which is dominating the universe when the wavelength is crossing the Hubble radius. Okay. So if you have cosmological wavelengths that we see, uh, if they are crossing the Hubble radius when the universe uh, is dominated by uh, uh, non-relativistic fluid, no, no relativistic fluid uh, with uh, zero pressure, uh, then they are almost scale invariant. They can be scale invariant. Uh, note that it's not necessary to have ordinary matter or pressurized matter dominating all along, just at the moment when the perturbation scale becomes comparable with the Hubble radius. But also, if for small wavelengths, when they cross, if another fluid is dominating, then the spectrum could be different. So maybe at some small scales, there could be some running in these in this models. Well, of course, it depends on the model. Well, the of the scalar ratio that you I will talk about the test to scalar ratio. I, I, the, is the subject of, of the rest of my, my talk. This is a very important. No, this is this is this is the spectral index. Yeah. It's just the spectral index. It's the temperature scalar ratio is a relation so between the amplitude. Huh? So you have an S and the alternative. Yeah, but this so is the spectral is index. Yeah, this is the yeah. yeah. This is the spectral index. It's not the amplitude. Okay. It's not the amplitude. I'll talk about the amplitudes uh, after. Um Okay, but there are some challenges. First, I, this is first. Uh, in many models with a single canonical scalar field with thin general relativity, including classical extensions, this ratio between the tensor uh, modes and scalar modes are bigger than 0 0.1, but observations give zero less than 0 0.1. So this is something that we want to address. There are some other models not based on canonical scalar field. Uh, where, uh, like a KSN fluid, uh, where this ratio is smaller than 0 0.1. But for canonical scalar field, they are usually bigger than 0 0.1 in, uh, in uh, general relativity and classical extensions. I think uh, Robert uh, mentioned that. Uh, there is also a problem with uh, dark energy, uh, because dark energy bouncing model is really something that we cannot uh, neglect. We must think about it, because uh, dark energy is something that is uh, dominating when the universe is big. Okay. So if you have uh, go back in the past and then have a contracting phase and the universe was also big, if there is a dark energy dominating now, maybe there was dark energy dominating in the past. And so they can affect the, 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 the spectrum. What happens with dark energy? 
So it's a very important problem that usually people working on monthly models doesn't take much, much care about that. Uh, in inflation, this is not a problem because dark energy affects, dark energy the way we understand it, uh, affects only at large scales and inflation takes place at very small scales. So dark energy doesn't affect inflation at all. But for bouncing models, dark energy, you should think about dark energy. And in fact, we have uh, studied a little bit about this and uh, there is some problems, uh, and I think with, which is related with the problem that uh, Robert uh, mentioned about uh, the instability of the city space. Uh, so what is the problem? So remember, I always plot this figure here, where in the past, the rubber radius becomes bigger than the physical wavelengths. But I was assuming that there was a normal fluid satisfying the energy conditions uh, dominating here. If you put dark energy, then at some moment, the rubber radius becomes almost constant. And then the physical wavelength will become bigger than the rubber radius if you go to the past. Now, we have made a, a, a paper with Beatriz, which is here, uh, where we, we imposed uh, vacuum initial conditions here, where the, the physical wavelength is smaller than the rubber radius. Then you calculate the spectrum, and then the spectrum oscillates, you see. Well, when uh, for large wavelengths they oscillate, but uh, well, in the paper we mentioned that there is this problem. If you go back into the past, you're given vacuum initial conditions here, and then you proceed. But if you go back into the past, then the wavelengths become bigger than the Hubble radius, and then they, this could give rise to instabilities. So that's something to to, to think about, and maybe it's related to to this problem that uh, Robert uh, talked about, uh, the stability of the center space. No, no. Uh, I, we, we, yeah, no, we define the vacuum here, you see, when the physical lengths were smaller, much smaller than the Hubble radius. You define here, and then you proceed. But if you go back in time with this definition, because it's an insert in vacuum, if you go back in time with this, uh, then um, maybe the, the, the perturbations will then get bigger than the, the Hubble radius there, and then you have a problem. Do you have to define a precise moment or anywhere in the zone? Uh, no, you have to press. Okay. Uh, no, not, not, any, uh, not anywhere, but at some places where we can define a adiabatic vacuum uh, with uh, good precision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a, this is a problem that people should think about. So they also have to uh, have the correct approach of bouncing, because of uh, bouncing models with two or more fluids, which uh, it's something that we are working and have results, but I uh, cannot I not have time to show you. And also, I think it's very important thing uh, in uh, bouncing models, is there a natural mechanism which leads NS to be slightly smaller than one, uh, one as in inflation? Because here in bouncing models, well, we just have a parameter, W, and then we put this equal, almost equal to zero, and then we have scaling value spectrum. But in inflation, uh, thing, uh, I think things is, uh, is, uh, is more general. Any, any, uh, any slow row inflation, you have an almost uh, the sitter patient, but which is not the sitter, then you have, it has to have our reheating process and all these things. And then naturally, in many, many models, the NES is really small, a little bit smaller than one. So in inflation, it happens for many, many models. In bouncing models, it depends on adjusting a parameter. So it's not the same, it's not the same prediction. It's just something that we have to adjust in order to, 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 to mimic, the, the, to, to have the observer thing. So I think it should be, it should be interesting to find a natural mechanism in bouncing models, as in inflation, which leads to NES slightly smaller than one. But this is something in study. Now, after half ten minutes. So, uh, in order to attack these two problems here, we studied a, a simple model uh, uh, where these two things, by our, our surprise, were solved. So. Uh, is this model here? It's a scalar field with an exponential potential, which uh, was presented uh, yesterday here. Okay. So, 
So this is the, the action for the scalar field, an exponential potential here. Uh, well, I will describe the, 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 classical, uh, the classical description for the exponential potential using this paper here, heard at once. Uh, so what happens? So I will define uh, this W here, V over rho, and then if you have the, I, I, I will show this uh, in more detail afterwards. There is an attractor if in expanding phase and a repeller in the contracting phase where this ratio between P and rho is a constant and this constant W is related to this lambda here uh, in this way. Now, as I want that you have uh, uh, a pressureless contraction, I will choose, I make the choice that this lambda square is square root of three just to have this uh, attractor or repeller part of the solutions uh, with W equals zero, because then I will have a uh, scaling value spectrum. So this is my assumption here. Now, I have the alpha is also uh, log of A, A is alpha dot. So uh, then I, I, I will define these quantities here, X and Y in this way. And then defining this quantity, the Friedman equation becomes this, this thing here, okay? With W, P over rho equal to two square, uh, two X square minus one. Though this X here is essentially defined the alpha. And the, 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 the other the dynamical equation using alpha as some kind of time, then you have this equation here where you have these points here, these critical points here. Now, so these are the equations. So you have these critical points here, okay? Uh, so the, 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 there are the critical points x equal plus or minus one, y equal zero, which are these points here. Now, now see that uh, all the trajectories have to be in the circle. x squared plus y squared equal one, which uh, is the Friedman equation, okay? So they must lie in the circle. Now, these two points here, this one here and this one here are exactly the singularities. Okay. These are the singularities. Uh, so uh, if you calculate W for here, then W here is equal one in these two points. Okay. Now, uh, there is another critical point where X is equal square root of two. And these, these are these two points here. And this is the attractor. And at this point here, W equals zero and W equals zero. And so what are the classical possibilities? The classical possibilities are either for a spanning phase, either you come from a singularity and expands to the attractor here, and then W goes from one till W equals zero, or we expand from here, and then it goes in this direction, omega. And then you go in this direction here. Note that this point here is uh, x equals zero. x equals zero means w equal minus one. So there is a dark energy phase here. That's why you took the exponential potential. There's a dark energy phase here. And then you go to w equals zero. So in this way, it goes from w equal one, goes up to w equal minus one, and then goes to w equals zero. For the contracting, the contracting part, you have, you contract from W equals zero through the singularity, to the singularity W equals one, or you contract passing by W equals minus one to the singularity, okay? Note that this uh, semicircle is completely disconnected with this one because these are singular points. Now, this is the classical picture. Okay? Now, let me show you something that uh, I think is quite interesting. It's uh, if you plot everything in terms of age, age and phi dot, we can see that the singularities, which has x equal plus or minus one, remember that x is the phi the alpha. This just means that alpha equal plus or minus phi plus constant and age plus or minus phi dot. So s minus is something here, s minus is something here, and s plus is something here, and s plus is something here. And the, the attractor or repeller is when x 
is square root of 2, which means alpha is square root of 2 phi, and so a is square root of 2 phi dot, so this, uh, these lines here. So the, the classical solutions are come from s minus and go to plus, or going from this and going here, or coming from here, going here, and coming from here, and going here. Now, suppose that you put down some quantum effect near the singularity. What should be the possibility? Using the De Broglie approach, where trajectories cannot cross. Now, uh, we cannot have, uh, so if you want, if you want to go from here to here, from S minus, then there is some quantum effects, then you, you cross the singularity and go to here, it should be uh, going from here and then arrive here. But if you do this, you necessarily cross this line here. This cannot be done. And the same thing here. So just analyzing this thing, you can feel that if you want to have a bounce, then the only possibility is coming from S minus and then go to here, or coming from S plus and then going to here. And in fact, remember that when you are here, then the potential is negligible and there is only the kinetic term that is important. And you have a, a, a bouncing solution for in this situation. And you can either come from I plus, S plus, so S plus, then bounce, and then go to S minus, S minus, so X minus one, X plus one contraction, or you can go in this way. So there is no possibility of having a bounce from here to here, or from here to here. The possibilities are to having a bounce from here to here, and from here to here, from here to here. So let me show you again. So either you come from here, and then due to quantum effects, you are put in this place here and go here, or you come from here, and then due to quantum effects, you are put to here and you go here. So either there is dark energy in the expanding phase, which is in the situation here, or in the contracting phase, never in both. So if, so if you put this, uh, this quantum correction, so the model should be necessarily asymmetric. Of course, we will choose dark energy in the expanding phase because we, we see dark energy. And also it solves the problem of the dark, dark energy in the past because there is no dark energy in the past. So we can put initial conditions here where the fluid behaves as a, as a where the scalar field behaves as a pressureless fluid. And then we, you go on with that. And in fact, well, we have calculated everything uh, rigorously, exactly, with exponential potential. And in fact, what we saw, it's published in this paper, we saw that it goes like this. And then due to quantum effect, there are some oscillations here. Not, it, go, it stops somewhere, and then it goes in this way. So these are the trajectories. Okay. So. Uh, now, what happens to perturbations in this kind of background? So, the scalar perturbations are described by V, which is related to the curvature perturbations in this way. Okay? And the tensor perturbations are described by this variable mu, which, which is related to the amplitude of the gravitational waves by this equation here. Now, remember that uh, we have, in the, in the contracting phase, when uh, have a situation where k, k square is much bigger than z to prime over z, then they oscillate, and then they, they, uh, the, the, the wavelengths become smaller than the rubber radius, and then they increase, and the same thing for uh, the tensor perturbations. Now, the, the, the thing that governs the situation where this, when this term here dominates over k square and this term here dominates over k square, is this integral here. You can see this analytically, this integral here for scalar perturbations and this integral here for, uh, for tensor perturbations. Now, if you are in the, in the, in the, in the situation where you have classical, uh, classical equations, the x are always very close to 1. So the evolution, uh, when the, the wavelengths Cross the Hubble radius, become bigger than the Hubble radius, will be almost the same for scalar perturbations to tensor perturbations. 
It'll be almost the same. However, if you have, I, don't, uh, I think you cannot see very well, however, if you have bounces which are very steep like this, where x can be close to zero, then there will be some enhancement of scalar perturbations with respect to tensor perturbations. And it's a nice feature that bounces which has this feature here are also bounces where the curvature at the bounce are not so close to the, to the Planck length, which is something that we must pay attention because you're using a wheel rate approach, which is not reliable if you get too close to the, to, to the Planck length. So, then, so these are analytical considerations to, to try to see, to explain, to find situations where scalar perturbations can, can get bigger than tensor perturbations. And in fact, we have calculated everything numerically. And then you see, when k square is much bigger than g2 prime over z, the fluctuations oscillate. And then they go beyond the, the Hubble radius, and then they increase. So these are the scalar perturbations and tensor perturbations. Note that they go uh, in the same pace, and they are almost the same amplitude. But here, near the bounce, near the quantum bounce, the scalar perturbations get increased with respect to tensor perturbations. Okay. This zeta, zeta A and zeta B are the imaginary and real part of the scalar perturbations, and H I and H B are the imaginary and, and uh, real part of the tensor perturbations. So note that near the bounds, due to the quantum effects, due to the departure of the general relativity, the scalar perturbations become much bigger than the tensor perturbations. And so we get R less than 0 0.1. Note that these amplitudes here must be multiplied by the L Planck with respect to, because of, uh, of, of our normalization uh, of rubber radius, and, and then we have, we, have, we have the right amplitude for zeta, which is almost 10 to minus 10. And because uh, we, we have selected this, this fluid, which has the repeller dW to zero, uh, w near zero in the past, then ns is equal to one. So this is a very interesting example where, where one fluid in a single shot could accommodate the matter contraction necessary in Bose models to have scaling variety spectrum and a dark energy in, in the expanding phase, which does not contrive quantum vacuum initial conditions. The quantum bounce is fundamental for that, not only through the connection between the contracting and expanding phase, but also because the quantum effects can yield large scalar perturbations with respect to tensor perturbations, which does not happen in class of models with a single fluid. So what we got, we got an S close to one, almost scale invariant, reasonable amplitudes with bounce not dangerous close to the Planck, length, Planck scale, and dark energy naturally accommodated. Well, the challenges are calculating non Gaussianities, which you have to, to see if they are bigger or not. Uh, what happens with modern and fluid, what happens with entropy perturbations, and particle production in the ball. So just to summarize the feature of the model, there is no singularity, no horizon puzzle, no flatness puzzle, Perturbations of quantum mechanical origin, as in inflationary models, enhancement of perturbations during evolution, features of, features of perturbations in accordance with observations, reasonable values for the curvature radius at the bounce, so the curvature radius at the bounce is bigger than Planck length, 10 to 1,000 Planck lengths. Accelerated expansion is naturally taking place in this model. And quantum cosmological effects are, are yielding physically observable fundamental consequences, which is uh, the fact that the scalar perturbations are getting enhanced with respect to, 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 to tensor perturbations. So, concluding, you just had, uh, well, just using basic, basic general, general, general relativity, you're using basic general relativity, nothing more than this. And the broadly bound quantum theory with a canonical quantization, which is not reliable if you really go deep in, in the Planck uh, energies, uh, yields a sensible but not yet complete to have, of course, this is a very simple example. It must be elaborated. Not yet complete, of course. Uh, there's so the non charities that must be calculated and all this. Bouncing models, which can explain the origin of cosmological perturbations in accordance with observations. 
I, I want to emphasize that in such models, inflation can be present, but it's not necessary, because these models use other, another perspective concerning initial conditions. Now, the use of quantum trajectories are very useful for quantum cosmology. For instance, it can explain in a very simple way a very old controversy concerning cosmological perturbations of quantum mechanical origin, which is their quantum to classical transition. This is a paper. And finally, in the context of the studied model here, that I present here, it was presented a quantum cosmological effect with a sizable observational consequence, which is R less than 0 0.1, which would not be there if the model were entirely classical, and which we have already seen. So well, I'm not saying that the fact that R is much smaller than 1 is a consequence of quantum cosmological uh, feature. Because, wow, many models of inflation, including the start of disk inflation, uh, gives that R is, is less than 0 0.1. But what's in, what is interesting here is that you have a model where if you treat uh, everything classically, you have a problem. But if you deal with the uh, quantization of the background, this quantization, quantization amplifies in a very profound way the scalar perturbations with respect to tensor perturbations in order to make this model compatible with observation. Which I think is a, a nice thing. Uh, it's, it's a quantum cosmological effect giving rise to an observational consequence. Well, if you can distinguish this from, from other reasons for having R0.1, it's, it's very difficult, of course. But I think it's a nice uh, thing to think about. Okay, that's it. That's, yeah. Questions? Yes. You mentioned it briefly last time. There, there is an issue with Bell's inequalities with this uh, yeah. type of story. Now, presumably, all these effects are taking place in, uh, in the bounds, uh, essentially. Uh -huh. But I would like to know how you... The Bell's inequalities. Yeah, how you oh. get the brown? You get no, the no. Brown? Uh, in the de Broglie-Bohm theory, uh, the Bell's inequalities are not, sat are not satisfied as in quantum mechanics because there is uh, this quantum potential which is non-local. So it's a is a is a non-local theory, uh, and so if it is non-local, so they do not satisfy Bell's inequality. Okay? Bell's inequalities assume uh, assumes that uh, locality and some kind of realism. This is the from the. Sometimes uh, you could have the bell inequalities uh, somehow perfectly okay, and you would. Uh, no, no, no. no. no, no uh, 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 you're, you're talking about this specific model or in general? I'm talking about this specific model. This specific model. Ah, no, in this specific. Yeah, but the, the quantum effect, I don't, I, this I, don't, I don't know if the quantum effects in this model uh, have some implications on Bell's inequalities. I don't know. This I don't know. Uh, what, uh, and, uh, and this is just in, a, um, in an homogeneous background. There is only one degree of freedom. Now, if you go to perturbations, then the issue of Bell's inequalities are there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So this, this, this is there. The issue of Bell's inequalities. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay, now I understand your question. So, if, uh, uh, as, uh, as I told you, as I mentioned to you, uh, because there is this growing and decaying mode, if the decaying mode becomes really, really very small, any, uh, any not such facts of Bell's inequalities will disappear because uh, anything that will not satisfy the Bell's inequality and, and that we could see in CMB should, would uh, depend on, uh, on the, the amplitude of this decay mode. And as the decay mode is very small, then you cannot see. This is a work uh, done uh, by Jérôme Martin and uh, Vincent Venin and the other one I don't remember. It's very recent work. And they, they arrive at this conclusion. They try to see signs of 
uh, violations of Bell's inequality in the, in the CMB, and they conclude that they cannot find because the decay mode is very, very small. And, and in fact, uh, we see that because the decay mode is very small, then the, 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 the perturbations behave classically. No, because I think in this situation you have always uh, have a condensate, a condensate in, in, in solid state physics. So, but there is an observer outside, and the observer outside. Here there is no observer outside. So, the whole system, the whole universe. So, then uh, then this measurement problem is inescapable. Uh, Nelson, uh, if I understood, you have shown that uh, the physics before the bounce and after the bounce is not symmetric. So yeah, the either the you have the dark the energy yeah, before yeah. the bounce and you cannot have dark energy afterwards. No, or, it's, it's an, yeah. Uh, uh, and if you have dark energy afterwards, you cannot have dark yeah, energy yeah, yeah. before. So yeah. that I, I suppose that you can make the same affirmation for inflation. If you have inflation after the bounce, you cannot have inflation, an inflation phase before the bounce. This I don't know, maybe. I don't know. If you have inflation after the bounce, you can. This is. Uh, uh, for inflation, you should have. Uh, because, because the exponential this, potential. If you understood this the equation of state, minus one. So that would be. Oh, okay, I see. Oh, inflation. okay, okay. If you, if you stay. stay oh, uh, I was thinking that you are uh, talking about in general terms. But Specific in this model. Yes, specific in this model, you are right. Mm -hmm. Specific in this model, you are right. So you can affirm that uh, if you have a bounce model with inflation, after the bounce, you cannot have uh, in, in this specific model with exponential potential, yes. Mm -hmm. If you have inflation after the bounce, then you don't have inflation before the bounce. But, but which specific model? The exponential with, with potential? With exponential potential. Okay. The exponential if, potential. If, if, you, if, you have potential another, if you have another potential, then I don't know. Then okay, have so, to so that is specific for the exponential for potential. For that type of the potential. Yes. You the cannot exponential. make that general. Yeah, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, another question. Uh, you have shown that uh, the scalar, the amplitude of the scalar perturbations are enhanced yes. compared yes. to the tensor perturbations yes uh, how, how much is enhanced it is uh, because you are comparing ratios right yeah this uh, is if you have scalar perturbations much enhanced you can have problems with primordial black hole formations is yeah. that an issue now th this depends on uh, how steep is the bounce if uh, you have a steep bounce uh, then the, the scalar perturbations are enhanced with respect to the tensor perturbations and the amplitudes for the scalar perturbations are OK. And there is no problem of black holes and all these things. Okay? But if you have a very, very steep bounce or a very profound bounce, then you can have some, some problems. So this depends or on how much this bounce is steep or not. Okay? Depends on the amount. Depends on the amount. Depends, depends on the amount. Uh, I see some raised hands, but still uh, running a little bit late. So to ask you, just to, to ask uh, Nelson directly uh, during lunch, maybe. So let's thank Nelson again. And we'll be back at two sharp, please.